Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 1050, College Algebra for Students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. In our penultimate section for Chapter 7 about pre-calculus, I want to review in this video some different techniques we can use to solve equations. And in particular, I want to talk about solving equations by factoring. There are lots of equations for which you can just perform inverse operations over and over and over again until you solve them. So like if you were given something like y equals 3 times the natural log of x minus 1 plus 4 uh, equals 0. Let, let's just say that so that uh, we don't have the variable y in play. We have an equation like this, right? You can just start peeling off operations one by one by one, right? You're going to subtract 4 from both sides. You're going to divide both sides by 3. You're going to exponentiate both sides by the power of e. And then you're going to add 1 to both sides. I can tell you exactly what happens. And then x would be the solution in the end like that. So many equations, you can just perform inverse operations over and over and over again to solve it, okay? Um, another thing I wanna mention here is when it comes to solving equations, I'm gonna emphasize the case where the right-hand side equals zero. Because if that wasn't the case, like if you had like some function, you know, some algebraic expression on the left-hand side and some algebraic expression on the right-hand side, you could always put it equal to zero, right? Just by subtracting things over. And so if you can solve an equation for which the right-hand side is equal to zero, you can solve any equation. So we're going to use that special assumption that the right-hand side equals zero in this consideration. Now, some other things we saw as we, as we solve equations, we don't have to clear denominators, right? Uh, we might have to, because the thing is what happens is our, func our, our variable in play here sometimes is imprisoned in things, right? Like, you know, if your x is inside of some parentheses, you might have to distribute to get it out. Or if there's like a power, you might have to foil it to get it out. Or if it's in a denominator, you might have to clear the denominators. There are some strategies to liberate uh, your variable x from some type of prism, pr prison of some kind. And I'm not going to talk so much about that in this video. We've done things like that before. A few examples might come up here. But really, in this video, I want to emphasize how useful factoring can be in a tool, in, in a tool tool as a tool to solve um equations. In particular, the reason why this is so useful, I should say, is in the calculus setting. Oftentimes, you have to set your so-called derivative equal to zero. Uh, don't worry about what a derivative is at this moment, but it's something you care about a lot in calculus. You have to set your derivative equal to zero. And because of the way you computed the derivative, the derivative often has, that is, we can, we can solve these equations often by factoring. So if I just give you a random equation, factoring might seem kind of limited in its use. But when you're trying to find critical numbers of a derivative, it turns out factoring shows up a lot. Uh, it turns out to be very useful by the nature of how one computes the derivative. So why is factoring a useful tool for solving equations? Well, it comes down to the zero product property we've seen before. That if you have real numbers, A and B, the only way the product AB equals zero is if A were equal to zero or B equals zero. I guess they could both be zero, right? But one of the factors had to equal zero. So this property allows us to use factoring to solve many, many types of equations of the form f of x equals zero. Like we said earlier, setting the right-hand side equal to zero is actually not a huge assumption whatsoever. We can always make it that way. And in fact, in, the, in, in calculus, like I said, on many of these problems that you probably will see, it turns out factoring is very useful in solving this equation f of x equals zero. It's a very useful tool. So notice graphically, solving f of x equals zero is just finding the x-intercepts of the graph. It's equally important also to determine the domain of f to know exactly where the expression f of x is undefined. We often write this as does not exist, d and e, right? These are so-called discontinuities, right? Uh, we've seen pictures of graphs that have like a vertical asymptote. Uh, maybe there's some type of like jump discontinuity that happened, right? These places are concerning to us as well. So when it comes to solving equations, if we can determine where a function is equal to zero, that is, we can find its x-intercepts, and we can find its discontinuities, we're actually in a very comfortable place where we can solve equations, uh, especially as one presses forward into calculus. Um, I should also mention that when f of x is itself a ratio, the x-intercepts are going to be the values that make the numerator go to zero, right? When the, so you have this fraction. Whatever makes the top go to zero, right, uh, that's going to give you zero still. And then when the denominator goes to zero, that's going to give you a discontinuity. It's either a removable discontinuity because the top also went to zero or it's a vertical asymptote. So we have fractions. We care about what makes the numerator go to zero and what makes the denominator go to zero. Because if we can find the x-intercepts, then we can solve any equation. Uh, but it's also going to be important to find discontinuities as well, what's outside the domain of the function.
Okay, so consider the following. f of x equals 4 thirds x to the 1 third times 2x plus 1 plus 2x to the 4 thirds. And so if we were to try to solve this equation equal to 0, we would factor it, right? Uh, how do we factor that? Well, we have to look, the, the, the most important thing to look for when you're factoring is the idea of a common divisor, greatest common divisors. What are the common divisors between these things? Okay, and so when looking at this thing right here, what I see when I'm looking for a GCD, I'll notice that if you look at the coefficients, I have a four, I have a two. You can't take more away than what the least holding term has. So if you look at four and two, um, they both have a factor of two because four itself could factor as two and two. So I could rewrite this thing as two times two, x to the one third, two x plus one, plus two x to the four thirds here, like so, this sits over three for which then we can identify the two that can factor out. So we take it out and this gives us two times two thirds x to the one third times two x plus one plus x to the four thirds. So you can take out the coefficient of two. That's one thing to do. Another thing we want to do when we factor is we don't want fractions if we can avoid it. So you'll notice that the first term has a one third as a factor, right? The other one doesn't, but you can always insert a one third by just times it by a strategic number one. If you just times it by you know, three over three, then you could factor out the one third, which is common to both. This will make it a life a little bit easier for us by taking out the fraction. So I'm actually gonna take out a two thirds and that'll leave behind, you'll see x or two times x to the one third times two x plus one. And then you're gonna get three times x to the four thirds. So as you're factoring out your GCD, I would recommend clearing denominators in the process. That's gonna be helpful for us. So that we took care of the coefficients, that's helpful, but what we really wanna grab is going to be the powers of x. Now, when you're looking at powers of x, one thing I should mention is that here you notice you have this product, x to the one third and two x plus one. When you're trying to factor, multiplying is the exact opposite of what you're trying to do. It's, it's, it's kind of inhibiting your ability to factor. So don't, don't distribute this thing, that's a no-no. Don't do it, leave it factored. All right, so you'll notice here that you have this x to the one third, and you have this x to the four thirds right here. When you're trying to factor out powers of x, you have to select the smallest power. And so when you're taking the minimum of one third and four thirds, the smallest power is gonna be one third. So we're gonna factor one third away from both of these terms. So it turned out our GCD was two thirds x to the one third. That's what we wanna factor out. We wanna factor out a one third here. But how do you factor out one third away from the, from the four thirds right here? Well, remember factoring um, division are basically the same thing. Uh, when you have something like x to the m plus n power, remember this is the same thing as x to the m times x to the n. So we can, we can factor using exponents here. So why that's helpful is that x to the four thirds is the same thing as x to the one third times x to the three thirds, like so one and three gives us four. And this x to the one third we factor away. And so that then gives us this factored form, two thirds x to the one third. That was our GCD, which we factored out. What was left behind? We get two times two x plus one. And then you're gonna get three times x to the three thirds. But the three thirds is just the first power. So I'm just gonna write that as three times x. Now you'll see that the GCD is taken out. There's nothing else we can factor amongst all these things. Now, at this moment, feel free to distribute and combine like terms. This then gives us two thirds x to the one third. We're gonna get four x plus two plus three x. And so simplifying that, we end up with two thirds x to the one third times a four, sorry, we're gonna get a seven x plus two when we add those all together. So now, once our function is completely factored, we're now in a situation where we, could, we find this x-intercept when this thing equals zero. Applying the zero product property, we have that either, we have that either x to the one third equals zero, which if you take the cube of both sides, you see x equals zero, or we have that seven x plus two equals zero, for which you subtract two, you get seven x equals negative two. You divide by seven, you get x equals negative two sevenths. And so we see then the x-intercepts are gonna be x equals zero and x equals negative two sevenths. We do have to pay attention to the domain, right? Or are there any values of x that were forbidden? For which when we look at the original function, always look to the original function here. Uh, the only thing that gives us any concern is we do have fractional powers, which means radicals, but we're taking cube roots. There's no even roots, no square roots whatsoever. So the domain of this thing, the domain of f, is gonna be all real numbers.
So since there's no restriction, there's no discontinuities, zero and negative two sevenths are our two x-intercepts for this function. Let's take a look at another example of this type of principle here. So if we were to look at this, what could we factor away? I like to look at the coefficients, right? You have 12, which factors as uh, three and four. We have a negative nine, which factors as three and three. So our GCD is gonna grab that factor of three right there. But what else can we grab, right? Notice we have a we have an x minus two to the four thirds power, and we have an x minus two to the one third power. So again, taking the minimum of four thirds and one third, this is gonna give you one third. So we're gonna slap on an x minus two to the one third power. You can only take away the smallest power of x minus two right here. So we're gonna factor that out as well. And so in factoring, we're gonna take out the three times x minus two to the one third. What's left behind? Well, when we factor the three away from the 12, we get a four. So factoring and division are really just the same thing, right? 12 divided by three is four. Then if we take x minus two to the four thirds power, if we factor away the third power, we're gonna get x minus two to the one third power, right? You subtract the exponents, four thirds minus one third is equal to three thirds, which is equal to one, like we saw in the previous example. So this actually just will become x minus two. And then with the next part, you have nine, we factor out three, nine divided by three is three. And then we have x minus two to the one third power divided by x minus two to the one third power. And you, when you factor, you're dividing, these things will actually just cancel each other out. And so you actually just get a three when you're done, like so. Uh, for which we took out the GCD, there's nothing else we can factor. So we're gonna multiply these things out. So just distribute the four. We get three times x minus two to the one third power. Uh, we're then going to get four x minus eight minus three, for which I can combine that constant and we're gonna get that g of x here is equal to three times x minus two to the one third power. And then we get four x minus 11, for which again, there's no discontinuities here. The domain of g is gonna be all real numbers. Because uh, again, the only thing that potentially could have been a problem was this fractional exponent, but an odd denominator means cube root here. There's no problem with domain. So as we use the zero product property, setting these things equal to zero, right? We see that either x minus two to the one third power equals zero, for which take the cube of both sides, we get x minus two equals zero. Adding two, we get x equals two as one of the roots. So let's record that over here, x equals two. And then the other one comes about when we take 4x minus 11 equals zero. Add 11 to both sides, you get 4x equals 11, divide both sides by four, you get x equals 11 fourths. And that then gives us the other, the other x-intercept, which is in the solution to this equation, g of x equals zero. All right, uh, let's do another example. Uh, this one we have f of x equals one third times two x to the negative one third minus five times x to the two thirds. We already have a one third factored out. Don't distribute it. We want things to be factored. When you look at the coefficients two and negative five, there's no common divisors to pull up there. Um, so let's just look at the powers of x. If you take the minimum power this time, the first x contributes a negative one third. The second x contributes a two thirds. The minimum is actually negative one third because negatives are smaller than positives. So you're gonna factor out a negative power here, okay? So in doing that, h of x is gonna become one third times x to the negative one third. So then you're gonna get two times x to the negative one third over x to the negative one third. And then you're gonna get minus five times x to the two thirds minus x to the negative one third. The first one's pretty easy because you have x to the negative one third divided by itself. So let's just go down to a one. So you end up with one third x to the negative one third times just a two. But for the next one, we're gonna subtract powers, right? So you're gonna get negative five x to the two thirds minus a negative one third, right? Since you're subtracting a negative, you're actually adding a power. And so we end up with here, two minus five times x to the three thirds power, like so. Um, I should also mention that if you have a negative exponent, negative exponents actually means take reciprocals, right? X to the negative one third is the same thing as one over x to the one third. And since we already have a fraction of one third, we can actually put those things together. We get three times x to the one third, like so. Uh, now three thirds, of course, is just a one. So simplifying our, our function h right here, h of x is gonna look like 
we have a 2 minus 5x on the top, and then we have a 3x to the 1 third in the denominator. So in this regard, if we set the numerator equal to 0, right? Because when this thing equals 0, only the numerator has to be 0. So you take 2 minus 5x equals 0. Uh, that will give us 2 equals 5x. Divide both sides by 5, you get x equals 2 fifths. So this is our x-intercept. Our x-intercept is going to equal 2 fifths. Now, unlike the previous examples, you'll see in this one that there actually is a value that makes the, that makes the denominator go to 0. That is, there is some value that's undefined. So in this situation, if we set the denominator equal to 0, divide both sides by 3, you get x to the 1 third equals 0. Take the cube of both sides, that is the third power, you get x equals 3. And so we see that this there actually is a problem with the domain. This thing has a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. So there is a discontinuity. Um, now, 0 and 2 fifths don't overlap, of course, here. So we see that there's an x-intercept at 2 fifths, but we have a vertical asymptote at 0. That is the domain of the function is everything except for 0 here. Let's look at a, just a couple more examples here. Uh, so this time, let's throw some exponentials into the play. We've been only doing power functions so far. f of x here is 2x times e to the x plus x squared times e to the x. So what are our common divisors here? What's our GCD? in this situation. When you look at the coefficients, you have 2 versus 1, nothing we can take out. If you look at x and x squared, we take away the smallest power, that's the first power, we're going to take away an x. And then you look at them in terms of the exponentials, they're both divisible by e to the x, for which you're going to get an e to the x right there. So that's what we need to factor out from our function f of x here. So f of x, if we take out the gcd, we're going to end up with x times e to the x, that was the gcd. Then the first one, if you take away x and e to the x, you're left with just a 2, right? For the second one, if you take away x, you have just an x, because you took 1x away from the x squared, and you also take away the e to the x, so you just end up with an x right there, all right? In terms of domain, in terms of the domain of this thing, it's going to be all real numbers. Um, power function, th there's no restriction there. e to the x is all real numbers, okay? If we set this equal to 0, by the zero product property, we have three cases to consider. We have x equals 0, we have e to the x equals 0, and we have 2 plus x equals 0, which implies that x equals negative 2. Uh, negative 2, like so. For which we grab this one, no big deal. We grab this one, no big deal. Um, on, the, on the middle case, though, I should mention that e to the x can't equal 0. The range of e to the x is only positive numbers. e to the x cannot equal 0. And if you don't remember that, to, to solve the equation, you take the natural log of both sides, you'd get that x equals the natural log of 0, which is actually like negative infinity. That's a vertical asymptote. So the same problem. x can't, you don't get a solution in that situation. The zero product property says that if a product of things is equal to 0, then one of the factors must have been, must have been 0. It doesn't tell you that every factor has to be 0 for some choice of x. Um, e to the x actually doesn't give you, uh, it doesn't give you a, uh, a solution in that situation. So in terms of the x-intercepts of this function, they occur at x equals 0 and negative 2, like so. Uh, let's do one more example. This time, let's involve a logarithm into play here. Uh, so what can we do here? Well, so the first thing that catches my attention is we have a division by x, right? That does affect the domain of things, right? What's the domain of this thing? So x can't equal 0, but we also have a, a logarithm. x can't be 0 or a negative. So the domain of g is going to be 0 to infinity. We see that. Um, so with the domain now established, I notice I have an x cubed divided by x. Uh, that would simplify to be 3x squared, natural log of x, minus x squared like so. And then as I start searching for the GCD, I notice that both of the terms are divisible by x squared, right? You have an x squared right here and right here. So let's factor it out. And so we see that g of x is equal to, uh, we'll take out the x squared, right? x squared times 3 natural log of x minus 1, like so. We set that equal to 0. So the first factor, x squared equals 0. You take the square root of both sides, you're going to get x equals 0, okay? The other one, we're going to take 3 times the natural log of x minus 1 is equal to 0, like so. Um, and then if we start solving this, we're going to add 1 to both sides. Add 1, add 1. We end up with 3 times the natural log of x is equal to 1. Next, we're going to divide both sides by 3, like 3. In which case, then we get the natural log of x equals 1 third. In which case, now we have to move the natural log to the other side. It switches to the natural exponential. 
and we end up with x equals e to the one third power, or if you prefer the cube root of e as the number there. And so then our x-intercepts for this function, the x-intercepts are gonna be at x equals zero and the cube root of e. Now we do have to throw out zero, right? Oh yeah, because zero is outside the domain of this thing. So maybe we didn't notice it until the end, that's okay. So we actually need to remove it from consideration and we get that this function actually only has one x-intercept and this happens at the cube root of e. Now there's some more examples I wanna do of solving these equations, you know, setting equal to zero using factoring. But this, what we've seen so far here is illustrating just how useful GCDs are. Factoring out the greatest common divisor is a very, very important tool, especially as one steps into calculus. Cause I have a little secret for you. All five of these examples, A, B, C, D, E, that we've done in this video, are calculus problems, right? Um, I mentioned earlier this idea you have to solve you have to solve for this so-called derivative is equal to zero. You don't know that you might not know what a derivative is yet. That's okay. But what I want to mention to you is that each and every one of these functions that we're dealing with right here is a derivative of a function. This is a calculus problem. You do that calculation. Then the next step of the problem is once you calculate the derivative. You have to set it equal to zero and solve, right? You have to figure out what's outside the domain and what's equal to zero. So these are actually calculus problems but without the calculus step, hence why we call them pre-calculus. So I can't emphasize enough how important this GCD factoring is because there will be a litany of calculus problems you will see in the future, which factoring by GCD alone will be sufficient to help you solve these problems and find the so-called critical numbers. That is the numbers that make the derivative equal to zero and those numbers outside the domain of the, of the function.